Uh, such a pleasure to have Alma Faust with us. Uh, Alma is taking it away for the grand finale of Living Histories today. <laughs> uh, it's all yours, Alma. Okay, so thank you so much, Sri, and, and thank you for this invitation. Um, so my name is Alma Faust. I am uh, I am a biomedical scientist by training, uh, so not a physicist, uh, but I um, I'm currently a research development professional. I run a small consulting company for um, academics looking to get funding. So I'm gonna quickly sort of take you through what we're going to talk about today. So just a little bit about my history, how my sort of personal and professional choices affected my career development. Um, and I want to take two slides at the very end, talk about a little bit about sort of lessons for myself. And I kind of reflected on this journey. It's like, what were the lessons that I learned? And so that was sort of informative for me to do this, but also kind of the lessons I want to share with you all. Um, I'm a little bit older than I think most of you. So it's been an interesting journey forward. So hopefully we'll, we'll uh, take something useful away from all my experiences. So I am originally from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I was born in Tuzla, which at the time was part of Yugoslavia. If you know anything about Eastern Europe, you know that math and science are heavily emphasized. And especially in our household, my dad is an economist with an accounting background and my mom was a mining engineer. And so clearly math and science were the top things to be interested in our house. Um, interestingly enough, my mom was also the first female mining engineer in her company. And so that sort of colored how my parents raised my sister and I, which is sort of that the idea that your nationality, your religion, your sex should in no way affect what you are capable of doing. Um, in if obviously I'm sure everyone knows, but in the early 90s, Yugoslavia broke up in a sort of very violent conflict between the different nations. Uh, my parents stayed and went, stayed, it kept us in Tuzla. They, they stayed there. They didn't want to leave because this was obviously their homeland, but also there was this idea of wanting to be part of the nation building in the future for Bosnia. Unfortunately, um, the war dragged on by early 95 was sort of a very much of a stalemate and people felt very hopeless as if the war wasn't going to end. And then in the May of 95, our town unfortunately suffered a, a pretty uh, heartbreaking ma massacre. There was an artillery shell to hit the town center where um, young people gather sort of when they go out. So they would all gather in kind of one area and the artillery shell hit right that area and 71 young people died, which was most, they were mostly late teens, early 20s, about 250 people were hurt. And so this was kind of the, like the last straw for my parents. This was what they decided, okay, we have to get the kids out one way or another. So um, they agreed to send me to the United States on a student visa in the September of 95, which is how I ended up in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky um, at 15. So I came to live with an American family there and I got a scholarship to Catholic high school, uh, Villa Madonna Academy. I finished my high school at Villa and then um, I was very sort of realistic about my ability to pay for American education, which was none. <laughs> so um, I had to go somewhere where I could get scholarships. So Hanover College, um, which is a small liberal arts school in Southern Indiana, gave me a, a sort of combination of a, basically a full ride scholarship so I could go there for free. Um, and so while I was at Hanover, I studied art history and chemistry. And art history I really loved. I was always interested in art. I was always a passion. I was also always interested in science, as I mentioned earlier, just because of how I was raised. Um, and I thought I was going to be a doctor. And then sort of the cold, hard reality of American education, medical educational system set in. And I realized there was no way I could afford becoming a doctor. I was not a permanent resident or a citizen. I couldn't get loans. So there was no way I was going to be able to pay for it. So I, in the meantime, ended up taking a bunch of biology courses. And one of my biology professors came up and said, well, what about grad school? You know, you can go for free and they'll pay you to go. And I was like, oh, <laughs> wait a second. This is a good idea. So I ended up going to the pathobiology graduate program at Brown University and finishing my PhD there and then ended up becoming a, a postdoctoral fellow at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And I worked sort of in both places. I worked in sort of a combination of, of DNA damage and DNA repair, um, just from kind of different aspects of it. 
Um, and then as I finished my postdoc training, I, I don't know how many of you know much about Houston. It's a great place to do academic science. It's absolutely fantastic place for medical bioscience. There isn't a lot of industry or um, there really isn't even like institution wise, there isn't a lot of places for, there's a lot of places if you're an MD or an RN, there's not a lot of places for if you're a PhD. So I thought, well, there's no way I could compete for a uh, position, uh, for an academic position and, and we'll sort of come back to this decision later. And so I thought, well, what am I gonna do? I decided to apply for a research administrative position. It became a grant coordinator at MD Anderson. And um, I hated the job, <laughs> but I fell in love with grants. I discovered that everything that I love about science was in a grant and everything that I hated was not there. So things like coming up with an idea and figuring out the experiments to test the idea and you know to answer the question and figuring out the controls and what are the alternatives that we can do. That was all part of a grant. Then all the stuff I hated, like your freezer gets left open and all your samples get defrosted and your gel runs out and your antibody suddenly stops working. Like none of that was there and none of that was in grant. So I thought this is perfect. So I ended up switching and becoming a scientific writer for a lab in Houston Medicine Methodist, which is just across the street from MD Anderson. And I was just writing papers and, and grants for the lab. And then I ended up getting recruited back to MD Anderson to run a, a new small research center they were putting together. And um, there my job was sort of run and kind of build this center, but then also help people get funding. And so I probably would have retired at MD Anderson, to be honest with you all, but it, my husband get, ended up getting moved to Chicago and I thought, okay, I'm gonna switch jobs. And I thought this was an opportunity to sort of, you know, look at my background and kind of get some new experience. And uh, most of my grants background at that point was all in biomedicine. So it was all NIH, it was all CDMRP. Um, I had no experience in NSF at all. And I thought that was kind of a, a Kind of a hole in my my knowledge and my experience so i took a position um which is basically like a grants person for the college of liberal arts sciences at uic and there i just worked with basic scientists so majority of what i did was nsf and it was a fantastic experience um i probably have for from a research development perspective for someone in biomedicine i probably have more nsf experience than than majority of people um, so, uh, but then COVID hit and then there were some leadership changes happening. And so I decided I'm going to strike out on my own. And so I've been doing that for the last two years. I went back completely working with biomedical scientists, but I really do appreciate that experience with the, with the NSF and the basic science. So now we kind of get to the crux of the stocks, which is what is research development? <laughs> what do you actually do, right? Uh, so there is a there is a national organization for research development professionals. They have this very elegant, long uh, definition of research development. But really, when you boil it down, the whole thing is really the art of getting money for research. And the reason why there are all these different activities in research development is because there's so many different ways to get money for research, right? So people specialize in different things. So there's federal grants and private grants and donations and industry contracts, and then also working with as part of team science and getting funded that way. Um, so for example, if you're really interested in getting money from industry contracts, I am probably the wrong person to call. I specialize in federal grants, so I would not be the right person. But that's why it's such a diverse community of, of professionals. So as I was working on this, I, I thought, oh, gosh, there's a couple of kind of things that kind of hit me um, and sort of why did I make the decisions that I made and how did this influence my career? And the first one I thought was just my sort of knowledge of, of me having very low risk tolerance, right? So very high risk aversion. And that sort of reflects in things like I could have gone to grad school for art history. It's something I was really good at. I was really encouraged by my professors to do that, but I decided not to do that because I thought it was professionally very risky. I didn't know if I could support myself, if I could have a job, if I, you know, can make enough money to live in, in art history. Uh, but interestingly enough, choosing to do art history was not the wrong decision because that's really where I learned to write. And so that was the, the um, experience that um, taught me how to make an argument and use evidence to convince people of my point of view, which is literally what we do in grants, right? So this idea of, of using evidence to argue a certain case 
um, that that all came that my my knowledge of that all came from art history. So I use that experience almost every day. The second part was this idea of um, ADHD. So I recently, about a couple of years ago, got diagnosed with ADHD because my son got diagnosed. Um, and it's sort of certain things made sense, right? So when I was in the lab, I, I was excellent at coming up with new ideas and starting a bunch of experiments. And then I could never finish a project or I had a really hard, I mean, I, eventually under a lot of pressure, I ended up finishing a project, but not because I really enjoyed doing it. It turns out that's a very classic ADHD symptom. So grants actually ended up being this perfect fit for me because it's super intense focus on like super short period of time, like two to three months, and then you're done. And then you get to move on to completely something else. So you jump from cancer to Alzheimer's disease. It's perfect for my brain, but it would have, um, but it sort of explained so many things about my experience in the lab. And then the last one is sort of the lesson I want to leave with you all, which is sort of decisions of kind of fear of failure, right? And I, I, so this is kind of the negative one. If I could take one thing back, right, from my history and my experience, it would have been this. And it would have been applying for an academic position after I finished my postdoc. And not because I would have made a very good academic PI. I probably would have still ended up on the path I am because of the other reasons we talked about. But because I feel like by not trying, I sort of limited my choices later on. And I kind of kicked myself for that choice for, for a big part of my professional career, I kept thinking, what if, what if I had tried? What if I had at least talked to people about it instead of just deciding I wasn't good enough? And now looking back on it, I probably could have been competitive for some positions given my CV, but you know, I sort of decided I wasn't, and that was the end of it. And this sort of fear of failure really kind of put me in a trajectory, which again, I'm very happy doing, but um, it, it it definitely, uh, it, that's the one thing that I would say, if I could take back, it would have been that one. And then uh, sort of lessons I want to leave with you all sort of from, from my experience. Um, so probably the biggest one, that there's no one true path to be a scientist. Um, you can be happy doing lots of different things. I've done lots of different jobs, <laughs> lots of different institutions. Um, and, and you can be happy doing lots of different things. Um, and I, I would also say jobs are temporary. Uh, don't ever be afraid of taking a job. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, I feel like it's always better to say yes and then decide that's not for you than kind of not even give it a shot. Um, there's lots of jobs that I've done that I, you know, like the grants and the research admin job definitely put me on the right path, uh, even though I didn't like the job itself. Um, and then uh, I would also say uh, there's lots of smart and capable people working in non-academic careers. So don't be afraid to pursue a non-academic career because you think you're going to sort of somehow fail or somehow you're not good enough or something like that. There's lots of brilliant people working in all sorts of careers. Um, do what makes you happy and sort of choose a career that, that really kind of works for you. And my final one is that you don't have to be in a lab to be a scientist. I've really struggled with this at the beginning of my career. I, people would ask me what I did and I would sort of pause and be like, how do I explain this? And now I've kind of gotten comfortable with the idea that I am a scientist. I just don't work in the lab, but I work with scientists every day. I talk to them about ideas. We try to come up with new ones. I look at data, I help, you know, sort of say, hey, this isn't this isn't the message that this data is sending and all that. So um, yeah, you don't have to be in the lab to be a scientist. You can be a scientist uh, writing, reading, um, and, and uh, lots of different ways. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, hopefully it didn't go over too much. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Alma, on behalf of our audience, many, many thanks. Uh, that was such a refreshingly uh, challenging talk for our imagination, for those of us who are used to seeing academic trajectories. To, so thank you, especially. Um, building off of that, I'm going to ask you one burning question and then uh, wrap, which is uh, now that you are outside of mainstream academia, is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely, yes, completely. <laughs> Looking in, um, do you uh, do you perceive uh, how inertial academics can be about their assumptions and their frameworks for what constitutes success and uh, what constitutes the one true path with prestige and all that? 
I, I think it's all connected. Absolutely. Um, I think we think of the, the best of the best stay in academia and then everyone else washes out. And the reality is people change careers and make career decisions for lots of different reasons that have nothing to do with their scientific ability or or their technical skill or their intellectual capacity. Um, and that's one thing that I think uh, having gone through all these different paths, working with different academics, also working with different people in different aspects of academia, it was very clear to me. You know, there's some research technicians that I've met that I thought were smarter than some of the professors I knew. But for a variety of reasons, um, they just pursued a different path. Um, and I think we, it's, it's sort of on all of us, right, to kind of change the story and to kind of change what we consider successful, which is sort of why, you know, I kind of decided to make this claim and be like, okay, yes, I'm a research development professional, right, to help people write grants. But honestly, I'm a scientist. I'm first and foremost a scientist. And um, once I kind of, you know, staked that for myself, I sort of made peace with the decisions of, from my past. So um, yeah, I, I, I do think culture change is necessary when it comes to career and, and sort of what we consider successful. Um, plug in from, from the business side of this, it's also on to funding agencies, right? When we do training grants and stuff like that, the, the biggest bonus points you get is how many academics that you produce. But in reality, most of science today is really influenced outside of academia. So I think it's on the funding agency themselves to also recognize that successful scientific paths don't always result in an academic position. Thank you. Thank you so much. On that uh, high note, let me end the recording and thank you on behalf of uh, all of us. Sorry, just one moment while I figure this out.